Hi, and uh, welcome to uh, the first of the presentations that I'm doing here this year at the Hopkinton Senior Center. Uh, my name is Arthur Bergeron. I'm an attorney at Myrick O'Connell. There are 70 of us at Myrick O'Connell. We're actually now the biggest law firm outside of Boston. Uh, but as a result of that, uh, everybody gets to do what they really like doing, and so I get to do this all the time. This is I do nothing but elder law. I like it because my clients think I'm young. This is terrific. Um, so. Uh, what I try to do every year is the first two presentations that I do in the spring are kind of more general presentations, and this is one of them. It's Elder Law for Couples. Uh, and so for those of you who've been here before, you've heard some of this information, but there are a couple of interesting things that have happened during the new year or during the last year. If you haven't been here before, then this may be new to you and you may be surprised. So um, as you know, if you have been here before, my, my, uh, my, uh, the people that I always talk about in my presentations are my friends Frank and Mary and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. And, and their goal in life is very simple. They want to live in their house until they die. They want to be buried in the backyard. If one of them dies, they want to leave everything to the other one. If the other one dies, they want to leave everything to their kids. If this sounds basically familiar, this is kind of your basic estate plan for a lot of couples. And so um, their issues, and we're gonna, because we're gonna start off by assuming that they are 65 years old. And if they're 65, their major issues are uh, Short-term incapacity, what happens if somebody just gets sick or has a stroke or whatever and is incapacit incapacitated for a while? Uh, probate avoidance and tax minimization, and we're going to talk about all of those things. So, as I tell people who come in, who are saying, don't I really have to have a will? Do I need to do this? Do I need to do that? Well, the most important thing you need to do is make sure that if you're incapacitated, there's somebody there who can take care of things for you. Uh, who can take care of your legal affairs through your power of attorney and who can take care and who can make medical decisions for you um, through your health care proxy. Now that's important no matter what age you are, but you get to our age and it's really important because it's just more likely that something could happen. And if something happens, chances are you're not going to die, right? If something happens, chances are, but you might be incapacitated for a while. Um, a statistic that I often use about that is, you know, you remember, Remember when we were growing up, right? And it, this is my crowd, right? You want, so whenever we were growing up, people would like have a heart attack and they die, right? You read about it, and then they'd have, a, or they'd have a stroke and they die. And now you never hear about that. I mean, once in a while, you know? Well, this, I, I finally saw a statistic to kind of verify this kind of anecdotal, what's changed? And that is that in 1960, if you had a heart attack or a stroke, your likelihood of living more than 48 hours was, um, or excuse me, your likelihood of dying during those 48 hours was 34%. Today, your likelihood is 3%. That's the change. It's totally different, right? So the, the issue you really want, need to kind of be planning for, unless you're real, already really frail, right, is this incapacity issue. So you need two documents. You need a healthcare proxy. Uh, and, you may, and you may already have one. Do you know where it is? Did you tell your proxy? But anyway, you, 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 you need a, a proxy. It has to have two witnesses. doesn't have to be notarized. You can name anybody you want, uh, except you can only name one person at a time. You can't name multiple proxies because if I'm the doctor and you're incapacitated, I don't want to be arguing with two of your kids regarding what to do. You know? So one at a time. Um, um, one agent at a time, and it can be terminated at any time. Even if you are, you've, si you've signed the proxy and the doctor has said you're incapacitated and you're in this kind of make-believe, say you're in the situation and you're in the room and your proxy's there and the doctor's there and the doctor says, should we operate? And, 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 and he's already said that, that you're incapacitated, so that he's talking to the proxy, right? And the proxy says, yeah, we should operate. And you're like, no, I don't want to be operated on. You can say that. No, I don't want to be operated on. And the effect of that is that it terminates the proxy. Terminates the proxy. For purposes of terminating the proxy, you're always presumed to be competent, right? That's what the statute says. The statute was built around really protecting your rights as the person who was giving this power. So that's an important thing. The second thing, though, is, so have you, first of all, have you told your proxy? So I talk to folks at hospitals regularly and the standard number they give me is that about 20% of the people they call who are listed on someone's healthcare proxy haven't been told even that they were on the proxy, right? That's really bad. 
right? Because you, you don't want to surprise your son or your daughter or somebody with, oh, I've got to make this decision now? You know, what? You know, it, and, and all of a sudden there's fighting in the family. How, you know, then there's other siblings calling. So you want to tell your proxy. And what you also want to do is, this is I have a strong feelings about this. You want to have a conversation with your proxy about what you think about, how you think about how you should be treated in the event that you're incapacitated. Now there are three, there are three projects or documents that people think about when they think about this. The, 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 many people have heard of the, the, the five wishes. There's this document that you can fill out which pretends to be legally binding and it's not. Um, um, which says, in which you're describing how you want to be cared for, typically if it's close to the end of your life. Uh, it pretends to be binding because it, it says this is legally binding in some states, but not here, uh, because it is effectively a living will and living wills are not legally binding. But it is a document that can give some instructions to people if you were really, really sick. Um, and then there, is, there, there are two projects, the, the Conversations Project and Honoring Choices, um, I, think, I think there have been speakers here that have talked about at least one of those. And I think I'm going to do more on this this year, because this is really important. That really encourage you, though, to have a broader conversation with the person who is your proxy. Because regarding how you really want to be treated if you're being treated for a long time. And so the example that I, always, that I give is, so you had a stroke, right? And you're not doing great. And so you're kind of like incapacitated and you're stuck and you're, you're not communicating a lot, and, but you're living, and you're living for a long, you're not in a vegetative state, but you're not in great shape, and you're living, and, and so the proxy has been invoked, right? The doctor has said, you're really not capable of making medical decisions, and now you get sick, you get pneumonia, and you're at home, and the question is, do you go to the hospital? Well, you know if you go to the hospital, they're gonna get rid of the pneumonia, chances are, but then you're gonna go back home, and you're gonna be kind of where you were when you started from. So the question is in that case, do you really wanna to go to the hospital? Do you really wanna to go to the hospital? Or would you rather just stay at home? Those are the kinds of questions that are raised by these documents. They're really important questions. And, and they're questions that you should talk to your proxy about and also to your doctor. And incidentally, it, it had been until actually last year that doctors, for want of a better term, would sometimes kind of blow this off because they're really busy, your doctors, and they weren't being paid. Medicare wouldn't pay for this conversation. Medicare now pays for that conversation. So if you talk to your doctor and you say, I'd like to talk about this set of issues, right? He could, he'll talk to you and he can actually bill for it, which makes it just easier for him to have that conversation. So this is really important. Um, where is your healthcare proxy right now, once again? Um, uh, the question is, so if I need the healthcare proxy, where do I find it? And this is a big deal, and, and this is something that, that once again, I, I, I think I'm going to be working on more this year. Because um, there's this whole question of, if lot, everybody, if I, you raise your, you know, if I ask how many people have a healthcare proxy, how many people here have a healthcare proxy? Raise your hand. How many people, if I ask you right now, could tell me where it is? Raise your hand. Oh, well, that's good. That's good, because many people can't do that. They don't know where it is, right? So my recommendation is, by the way, so the best place that it can be, first of all, you should have your agent have a copy of it. But the second one is, go to the doctor and have it put into your file. Your doctor is required, actually, under state law, if you give him a, your health care proxy or her, to put it in your medical record. So that if you get sick and you're in the hospital, the doctor can just email it over to the hospital, right? Another place that you may think that they have it is at the hospital, because a lot of people have done a healthcare proxy because they got sick and they went to the hospital, and the hospital required that they sign a proxy right there, because the hospital wants to make sure while you're there, if something happens, they know who to call. But when you leave the hospital, the hospital usually throws those away, right? They throw them away. <laughs> so, so don't figure because you did one once at the hospital that it's there, okay? So that's healthcare proxies. Power of attorney, very simple. Power of attorney, you don't need any witnesses uh, as long as you're only dealing with property in Massachusetts. There are other states that require witnesses so that if you have property in New Hampshire or Maine or Florida, 
for example, <laughs> you need witnesses on your health care proxy. Never has to be notarized. Um, but you want to have it notarized. I'm going to talk about that in a second. And as opposed to your healthcare proxy, you can name more than one person at the same time. So if you want, if you've got a couple of your, if you got, you want to name your spouse, for example, and your trusted child jointly and severally, so that if your spouse, for some reason, if you had an accident and your spouse is not around, your child can deal with it. Or you can name two of your kids jointly and severally so that any one of them can deal with any of these issues. The only thing about, um, um, and, and, and if you do a new, a new power of attorney, it doesn't revoke the old one. You can have a bunch of powers of attorney out and valid at the same time. So if you're thinking, oh, there's you know, one of my kids, I'm, not, I'm fighting with them and I don't want to have them, so now I want to name a new one. Well, don't forget, you also have to do a separate document revoking the old one. And you want to tell any of your financial institutions that you did that. So that if he shows up with the old one, he can't get all the money out of the bank. Because if he has a power of attorney, there's a provision in there that protects that financial institution in the event that you had actually executed a new one. Um, power of attorney provisions. Real estate authorization, a couple that you really want to have in there. Um, real estate authorization, if you want to make sure that your attorney on your behalf could convey your property for you, that needs to specifically be in the power of attorney. Um, and if you're allowing the power, your agent to make any gifts on your behalf, that has to specifically be in there. And if the gifts can be to yourself as the agent, that has to specifically be in there. This issue comes up um, a lot, not a lot, on occasion when I'm dealing with asset restructuring. If someone's in a nursing home and needs to qualify for mass health, and so we need to shift assets from the sick person to the well person. I'm going to talk about that a little later. That can all be done as long as the well person has a power of attorney from the sick person and as long as the power of attorney authorizes transfer to the well, transfers to the well person and there's no cap on those transfers. That's the other thing you want to watch out for, especially in older powers of attorney. Oftentimes attorneys would draft these powers of attorney really with financial planning in mind, not with these kinds of issues in mind, and therefore they'll, put a, they'll have in there a cap on the amount of a gift. And the cap will typically be the amount of the federal gift tax exemption in that year, which I won't go into. But the bottom line is, if there is a cap, that means that you can't move around all of your assets beyond that cap. So you want to be familiar with that. So those two are really important. Now, estate planning. Um, so if you just drop dead today, uh, but you owned everything jointly with your spouse, uh, then the, your assets would not, no asset would have to go through the probate process because when you died, your, at, your interest would evaporate, your spouse would become the sole owner, no probate would be necessary, so no will would be necessary. If you died today and you're Frank and Mary, or you're Frank and you died today, and things, assets weren't jointly held, then the assets that are owned by you individually would have to go through the probate process. But even if you didn't have a will, if you wanted your plan to be that if you died, everything went to your spouse, and if your spouse was dead, everything went to your kids, well, that's exactly what happens without a will. It's exactly what happens without a will if asked regarding assets going through the probate process. So in that situation, you really didn't need a will. So the time that you really want to think about having a will is if that system doesn't necessarily apply to you if you're really mad at your husband and so you don't want to leave it all to him, or you know, there's something else, or it's a blended family. If it's a blended family, if you've got kids from previous marriages and when you die you really want to leave the assets to your original children, any of those, you have to have a will. Or, or if there's some reason that you don't want to leave it, the money directly to your kids. Um, these are the three most important ones that come up all the time. Either your child has got creditor issues, big student loans, had a financial problem, this was the free spirit in the family, so they got no money and they got creditors, right? <laughs> in that case, or you got a spouse that's there that you're really not crazy about and they think there might be a divorce and the last thing you want to do is leave money to the daughter-in-law you never liked in the first place, right? You want to do that. Uh, or one of your children has a disability and therefore if you give that child the assets directly, you're basically disqualifying them for the government payments that they might be entitled to, SSI or MassHealth or, or, or um, housing assistance, 
because now they've got assets. So in all of those cases, what you want to do instead is you want to put the assets into trust for their benefit. Typically, you want to name one of your other kids as the trustee because as long as your child who has the problem does not have the legal right to get to the money, a creditor can't force him to get it, a spouse can't count it, and the agencies that are qualifying him or her for a disability for, for a program like MassHealth or SSI won't count those assets, right? So in those cases, you really do need a will. Other than that, you know, honestly, people say, I really, I don't, I'm, they come in, I'm all stressed out, I don't have a will. Well, you know, especially if you're married and you hold things jointly. I mean, I had a couple yesterday, and they, they have $2 million, but they, don't, they own everything jointly, except for the, you know, the, the 401ks and the stuff where there's a named death beneficiary. And so I went through it, I said, actually, you don't need a will. I mean, they may need to do some other things, but they really didn't need a, a will, okay? Um, other issues that come up, right? Um, if, you're, if you're dealing with any of these issues, um, who should run things? If you're na naming in your will, you'd name who the personal representative is to manage your assets. You just don't want any ties. You don't want to aim an, name an even number of people. Who gets what? Just make sure you're avoiding uh, ambiguity. If, if, you've, if you've got tangible personal property, the stuff in the house, typically you just say have a provision that says the kids are going to divide it up however they want. But you don't want to just say that. You want to make sure what happens if they can't figure it out. So you want to say, if they can't figure it out, the personal representative, used to be called the executor, is going to make the decision. You want to, you want to figure it out. Um, you don't want to, you, regarding the house, if your goal, a lot of times people will simply have a will that says, I leave everything to be divided among my kids. But if you have a house, do you, really, you don't want the house to be divided among your kids, right? You really want the house to be sold and the money to be divided among your kids. And you should say that in the will, because otherwise, technically under the will, what the personal representative is supposed to do at the end is transfer the house to the kids, all three of them, all five of them. And then if they, need to, if they want to go sell the house, everybody has to agree, right? So everybody has a veto regarding, you know, and one thinks it's worth a fortune and the other one needs the money and is fighting. So say you want it, the house sold and the proceeds divided. Um, if there is an issue regarding house occupancy, which often comes up, comes up increasingly the older I get, that there's a child who is living in the home, and you kind of want to take care of the child, a lot of times that's the free spirit <laughs> who's back at home, or there was a divorce or whatever, there's somebody living at home. You, and, and you say, well, I really want to take care of that child, and, I, and I'll tell people, so let's, spec let's be clear on how that works, right? So does the child have to pay all the bills? Yes, right? And the taxes and keep the you know, roof, you know, and yes. And if that doesn't happen, then what happens, right? And so if the property is being held in trust for the benefit of that child as a result of all of this, you want those rules spelled out. And you want to give somebody the power, if the child's not living up to those rules, to sell the house, right? So that there isn't this fight. Well, there may be a fight, but at least it's clear who wins. If, if, the, if the child isn't really maintaining the house and the house really needs to get sold. And then finally regarding grandchildren, that's the time where if you're giving money to grandchildren, if it's a significant amount, you probably want to have that money held in trust for them until they were a particular age. Now, you know, it, it, and, and, and out, at our age, it may be that the grandchildren are already old enough to get the money, but you want to think about that, okay? So those are wills. Probate avoidance. Why would you want to have probate avoidance? Well, um, the main reason, what is the point of probate? The point of probate is to figure out who gets things that you own in your individual name at the time of your death. So that couple that I talked to yesterday, that had, uh, had two houses, because there were two different marriages, and they're, they're, now it's a bl they're blended, and then, and then IRAs and 401ks, and they had, a, they had an investment account, but it had a, trust, a, t a pay on death provision in the, in the investment account. So there's a whole variety of assets and when you look through them one by one, you realize that you, I could figure out who got that asset after death without needing a will, right? You just kind of go through the, but if there are assets, then you need to, that's the reason why you'd have the probate. So once again, if you're married, this may not be an issue. The time when, the, when somebody may want to restructure things so as to avoid probate is after the first one's dead, right? Because when the first person dies, there probably won't be a probate 
But when the second one dies, there probably will be unless you've done something. So um, the reason why you want to avoid probate is it costs money. You have to, you know, you have to pay the lawyer to go through that process, probably five or ten thousand uh, dollars. But more importantly for most people um, is the delay. Because any assets that go to probate before they go to the beneficiaries who are supposed to get them are subject to the claims of creditors. And your creditors have one year from the day of your death to file a claim against the estate, which means the assets really aren't supposed to get distributed until after that year. But you say, you don't have any creditors. But I say, the system is designed to make sure you don't have any creditors. And that's the reason why the assets have to stay in the pot for a year. So if, if you can, there's a good reason to avoid, um, avoid that. And, if, and it, remember, though, having a will does not avoid probate. This comes up regularly. People will tell me this. The will simply says to the person who is the personal representative how to cut things up at the end, right? If you don't have a will, there are these other rules, and I talked to you about those other rules, the rules of intestacy. If you have a will, then the rules are the rules in the will. And no one can vary the rules in the will except for a spouse who can waive the will and get a statutory share. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit at the end because those rules just changed. Um, but in general, um, the will doesn't avoid probate. Uh, no, not in general, ever. The will does not, having a will does not avoid probate. Why avoid it? Because of the cost and because of the one year delay. And also because of those creditors, by the way. You know, if you've, if I, have a, I have a family in Nantucket um, that that has got this terrific house, well, and it's Nantucket, so everything there is worth more than a million dollars. Um, and, and they, but they had many, several kids, seven, seven kids, old, it was a 1950s type family. And they had seven kids, and uh, you know, some of them went to college, and some of them didn't, and blah, 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 and there's a few free spirits. And so now there are these kind of old student loans for a number of them for which they co-signed, and the total bill now is about $200,000. And they don't have a lot of other assets. Right? And they're, and they're concerned because they'd really like this house when they die to get sold and everybody gets a piece of the house. So I said, well, as long as you make sure that your assets don't go through probate, at the moment that you die, all those, all those debts get wiped out. Because all of, the, all of the creditor claims for all those student loans that they co-signed, when you, when some, if they die, are only good against their probate estate, not the other assets. So it allows them to avoid that, right? So there may be a reason to avoid them. So um, in this situation, um, so this, they've got, they, the Frank and Mary own a house that's worth 350. They own that jointly. Frank's got an IRA worth, for, for 300,000. They've got joint savings. Frank's got an annuity, and that, but Mary's the named beneficiary. Mary has savings of $50,000. Their total assets are a million one. If Frank dies, in this case, is there a probate? Is there a probate? Raise your hand if you think there is a probate, if Frank dies right now. Why? Mary's saving. No, but Mary's still alive. Oh. Right? You didn't say whether the IRA 401k has Mary at the Ah, a good point. If Frank forgot to name the death beneficiary for the IRA or the 401k, then those money drop into the estate. If he named a death beneficiary, though, there's no probate. So there's no probate in this case, right? So once again, if you're married, kind of go through these assets, it may very well be that there's no probate. And by the way, there's a special rule regarding cars. Uh, if you own a car at the time of your death, and it's a pleasure vehicle, that's actually what the statute says, and you're married, then according to this statute, it's presumed that your wife is the surviving joint owner or your, sp your spouse is the surviving joint owner. So the spouse could literally go to the registry with the, your registration or with your title and with her, her or his marriage certificate and they'll transfer the title into the other person's name. So that's not going to trigger a probate while you're married. One of the most common reasons why probate goes, happens inadvertently is if you're single and you've got all your assets jointly, but you got a car, and you left the car in your individual name, and therefore there has to be a probate. Um, so there are a number of ways to avoid probate. One, as we talked about, is joint ownership. One is having assets that have transfer or de on death, TOD or pay on death, pay on death, or POD clauses. Uh, one is to create a trust. We're going to talk about that in a second. And one is last minute giving. I want to emphasize this because nobody ever does it, because they think there's a gift tax. And that's kind of a joke. So, 
uh, so in Frank and Mary's case, they've got a, a million two. Now, it, it, if they decided, if, in, if one of them dies and leaves all the assets to the other, then there is no estate tax. We're going to talk about that in a second. But if Mary were single and had a million two in assets and died, there, there, is a, there would be an estate tax. If, though, she gave away all of her assets the day before she died, there would be no estate tax. Oh, but isn't there a gift tax? No, there is no gift tax, right? There is, the only time the gift tax would apply to you is if, if during your lifetime you've given away what you have as your, as, your, as your lifetime exclusion, which right now is $11 million. So if you've got more than $11 million, talk to me. But otherwise, because I really want to be your, be your lawyer if you have that <laughs> amount of money, but, but if you don't, then just remember that you know, if you just tell the person you've named on your power of attorney, for example, before, if I get sick, just give everything away. You know, you've got the list of who gets what, just give everything away. And they do that, then when you die, there's no estate tax, okay? So, so a lot of times you can just handle this with last minute giving. So, uh, you can also avoid probate with a revocable and amendable trust. This is the most common mechanism that folks use in order to avoid probate. If they are worried that maybe something might happen to both of them, even though they've got everything in joint names right now and therefore they want things protected. So what you do is you create a revocable and amendable trust. A trust describes a relationship between two kinds of people, the trustee and the beneficiary. When I hold things as trustee, I am the legal owner of, those prop of that property. So as far as the rest of the world is concerned, they don't have to care about the beneficiaries, they can deal with me. I can go to the bank and take the money out of the trust account. I can convey the property I can convey the house if I'm the trustee, as long as the trust doesn't say something else, right? Um, but when I die, those assets that are in trust are not just in my name and therefore do not go through the probate process. Instead, they're still in trust. And what I, pro what I would probably do if I were Frank and Mary is I'd name, we'd name each other as, we'd name the both of us as trustees. We would say that if one of us died, the other one would become the trustee. And we'd say when the two of us died, that one of the kids, Peter, Paul, or Mary Jr., or all of them, would become the new trustees. If we structured things that way, then upon um, those people's death, none of those assets would go through probate. The kids would instantly have, have the ability to get to the assets and divide them up. Um, th that has no effect, and as a result, results in that creditor avoidance that I talked about. This has no effect on the taxability of any of these assets for estate tax purposes. The probate estate, and the taxable estate are separate things, but it does avoid probate. Now, speaking of estate tax, <clears throat> estate tax avoidance. Uh, a short history of the Massachusetts estate tax. Well, now this is just, for a lot of people who just have, you know, you know there's an estate tax, but to understand how it works, you really understand where it came from. So back in the 20s, I believe, about the same time that the federal government created their estate tax, Massachusetts created its estate tax. And the, and the theory, the reason for it, it was the 20s, right? So like now, economy was booming, robber barons making a ton of money. And there was just this kind of popular sense of, well, you know, if, wh why should the kids of the robber barons get all of the money while everybody else is having to pay the income tax, you know, and pay their fair share? So it just seemed fair that, that you would, that, 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 you, that at the point a person died, you know, certainly you can spend as much as your own money as you want, but when you die, that the government would take a share before the money got inherited. And so the decision was to start to impose an estate tax on rich people. And rich people in the 1920s was defined as people having more than $40,000, $40,000. And so at that time, um, the, the Commonwealth um, adopted the estate tax and created this chart, um, which you have also in your handout. And the top category is if you have zero to $40,000, there's no estate tax. This is regarding what your taxable estate is. If it's as to dollars between 40 and $90,000, the tax is eight tenths of 1%. And then between 90 and 140, it's 1.6%, and then it gradually goes up. And you, you notice these, these, cat these categories are really small because these amounts were really huge. $50,000 then was huge. I remember my parents, bought their house in the 1930s, in 1936, for $2,000 in Marlboro. It was a two-family house, and they couldn't figure out, they had a mortgage, 
And they were trying to figure out how to scrape up the money to pay the mortgage on the thousand dollars. You know, this was a lot of money, right? So that's the chart that was adopted. And it's still in effect. This chart is still in effect. So you need to understand that. So, what, and, and as a result of that chart, this is going to be important to our story. If you now have die with a taxable estate of a million dollars, and you do all these calculations, your tax is $36,560. If you die with an estate of a million one hundred thousand dollars, and remember that's how much Frank and Mary have, your estate tax would be forty-two thousand six hundred forty dollars, according to the chart. So, there's the chart; it's still in existence. But over time, as you know, property values went up, right? And there got to be a point in the 1950s where everybody that had a house was paying a, a, an estate tax because the house was throwing everybody's number over. And so the legislature was faced with what to do with this because the middle class was getting upset. And so th what they could have done was they could have amended the chart. And that would have been the, the, the kind of the right thing to do. But they didn't because that would have been too much work. This is what I think, right? So instead, they did the easy thing. They simply increased that minimum number. They said instead of not taxing you for, for an estate that's over $40,000, they said, we're going to increase that number to $100,000. No tax as long as your estate is below $100,000. And gradually over time, that number went up, first to three, and then I think to six. It's now a million dollars. And it's been a million dollars for almost 20 <coughs> years. Um, and I can actually remember when that got changed. You know, it's funny, you get old, and you actually, you actually remember this stuff, right? So. So that million dollars, if you have an estate of, an taxable estate of less than a million dollars, there's no estate tax. Which then leads to the question, well, what if you have a million and one dollars? Then what happens, right? Now, in some states, <clears throat> many states did exactly, <clears throat> this story is very sim was very similar to what happened in many states. In some states, like in Rhode Island until recently, um, their estate tax was referred to as a cliff tax. So there, over time, they had gradually increased that bar, and so the bar was, at that point, $650,000. A state of less than six fifty, dollars no estate tax. <clears throat> Thank you. Can you grab me some water? You could tell. Oh, Cindy Cormier, she's so good. Um, but if you had a dollar over, you fell off the cliff, and you owed all of the money you would have owed according to their chart, right, which, is, which was, you know, $30,000 or $40,000. Excuse me. Massachusetts um, didn't want to do that, but they did something kind of close. What they did was they said, okay, we're going we're gonna to set up an alternate way of calculating your estate tax. So if you have an estate that's over a million dollars, you have to figure out your estate tax two ways. First, you do the chart. Second, you say, what if I took all the dollars over a million dollars and taxed them at 40%, 40 percent, 4-0? Right? And then you get these two different numbers, right? And then you have to pay the tax, whichever one is lower, that's the one you have to pay, right? So in the case of an estate of a million dollars, your estate tax is zero. In the case of an estate of a million one hundred thousand dollars, your tax is forty thousand dollars. So effectively, you're paying a marginal rate on that first hundred thousand of forty percent, right? Now, as that applies to our, to our chart, remember, Remember, that's, that's, the, that's the situation, right? They've got an estate of a million. If one spouse dies, leaving everything to the surviving spouse, there is no estate tax. Um, because the amount that you give your surviving spouse gets subtracted from the taxable estate. If the second spouse dies the next day, though, so if Frank died and left everything to Mary and then Mary died the next day, the, estate, the taxable estate would be $1,100,000. The way you compute it would be by comparing would be by first of all saying, how much according to the chart? There it is, 42,640. How much if we take 40% of all the money over a million? $40,000. So this is what she would pay. This is what the kids would pay, $40,000. And now, now as, as you can imagine, these lines cross pretty soon here, right? Because the amount, 40% of the dollars over a million, soon gets to be greater than the amount according to the chart. Because according to the chart, those dollars you, that you're, you're paying it are about 6%. And that line's at about $125,000. So 
This kind of tax avoidance, though, is really important for people like Frank and Mary, who've got assets just over a million. <coughs> because you've got a big incentive to get it just under a million. Because the government's getting 40 cents of all the dollars over a million for that first 100,000 for the first $125,000. So the question is, what do you do? The answer is, <coughs> it's, pretty, it's pretty straight. I want to say straightforward, but it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you do a tax, an estate tax avoidance trust. The goal, of this, the, the, this, the goal of this trust is premised on the fact that in this situation, if Frank died and left everything to Mary, instead of giving it to other people, he has basically thrown away his ability to give away a million dollars tax-free, right? Because if he gave away a million and Mary gave away a million, there wouldn't be any estate tax. It's only if he gives it to Mary and then Mary gives it away that there's an estate tax because her estate is more than a million. So the goal is to make sure that when the first person dies, there are enough assets to, subtracted from what was given to Mary to make sure that when Mary dies, her estate is under a million. And the way you do that is you specify, you, is you say, typically in the, in the will or in a standalone trust that you create while you're alive. And this, would be, a, this would, would be another reason for creating a trust while both of them were alive. You say, each of them says, when I die, up to a million dollars of the assets that I would have given to my spouse, instead, I'm going to put in trust for the benefit of my spouse. And in that case, my spouse can be the trustee. And my spouse, as the trustee, can have the right to distribute to himself or herself as much as she wants or he wants. But as long, and if she does, and then when she dies, she has, I'm, I'm pretending that Frank died first, and then if, when Mary dies, she has more than a mil million dollars, well, then there's going to be an estate tax. But as long as she leaves the money in the trust and uses the rest of her money to live on, the other, whatever she, other else she has in assets, when she dies, whatever is in trust doesn't get added to her estate. So if, for example, in this situation, remember the house was worth, I think, $300,000? Suppose we structured this so that when Frank died, the house went into trust for Mary's benefit. Well, thereby reducing the remaining assets to only $800,000. Mary hasn't lost anything because she's the trustee of the trust. If she wants to sell the house, she can. Right? Money goes into the trust. If she wants to use the money, she can. She can take it out. But as long as she leaves it in trust, if she then dies, that money isn't considered part of her taxable estate. So as long as we keep the amount that goes into the trust, when Frank dies below a million, there's no estate tax there. And if by doing that, we've left her remaining assets at below a million dollars when she dies, there's no tax there. So effectively, if you've got assets that are up to $2 million, you can avoid all of the estate tax. If you've got assets that are more than that, you can still reduce the estate tax by, if the first spouse dies, putting as much as a $1 million into this trust, thereby reducing the estate of the second to die by as much as a $1 million. In the case of the people I talked to yesterday, that was what, one of the things I suggested. It, it, the result of that, if one of them put up to a million dollars in trust, thereby reducing the total estate of the second to die from four million to three million, they save $100,000 in estate tax. So that's what, when, when, you t when you're talking to a, your legal advisor or whatever about estate tax avoidance, that's the game they're playing. And the important thing to remember about that game is you can only play the game while you're both alive. Once one person has died and left everything to the second person, can't play the game anymore, okay? Uh, and we, yes, so this is the, once again, this is estate planning for couples. This planning option to deal with this only can happen while you're both alive. Finally, asset protection. So for this example, we're gonna assume that Frank and Mary are 80 um, because everything that I just explained to you about what they could do while they're both alive when they're younger is all revocable and amendable. So if they get older and therefore their, their planning goals change, they can change everything, right? So now pretend that they're now 80 um, and, and, and now they're re really a lot more worried about nursing home issues, right? The reason is very simple. 
um, this is, these are the numbers from the Alzheimer's Association. If you are, your likelihood of getting a, a, a disease that causes dementia, and the most common one is Alzheimer's, but there are a number of others, and therefore needing nursing home care for some period of time. If you are 65 years old, that chances of that happening are one in nine. If you're 85, they're one in three. The reason for that is, if you're 85 and you had something else, cancer, diabetes, you're probably dead. So the pot of people that is still there at 85 is kind of consists of the people who may end up getting stuck with one of these diseases, which are really kind of old age related diseases, okay? So that's why for so often I'll, be ta I'll talk to folks who had done the earlier plan. They have, they'll, they'll tell me, they'll say, oh, I don't worry about the nursing home issues. All my assets are in trust. And I'll say, well, what trust? Well, what do you mean? Well, it turns out they did a, a trust that was designed for probate avoidance purposes. And so they kept control of all the assets. And so it's not protecting anything. So the point is, as you get older, you want to kind of re-examine these things in light of your own situation. What's your health? What's your age? What, you know, have your children changed? So, at this point, if they're 80, let's assume that they have the same assets, a million one, uh, but, and Frank has Social Security, and that's his only income other than what he's earning from you know, the savings and stuff of 2,000 a month, and Mary has Social Security of 1,000 a month. And so the question is, what happens if they're both alive and Mary needs nursing home care? So here we go, Mass Health 101. If, if that were to occur, um, if, if Mary needed nursing home care, and given this situation, and they didn't do anything else, um, mass, or Medicare, which by that age is what they're using, Medicare uh, would pay for that nursing home care as long as Mary had been in a hospital for at least three days, <clears throat> and then they'll pay for the care for up for 100 days. That's it. Medicare cost, covers the cost of getting better, not the cost of staying the same. So the way that you show that you're getting better is, first of all, by proving you were sick, and that's why you have to be, have been in the hospital for three days. And then you assumed after 100 days you're not getting better. And so they just stop, right? And at that point, you're on private pay, and you're paying probably about $14,000 a month now. Uh, some places are less than that around here. You go to St. Patrick's up in Framingham, probably one of the best ones around here. That's over $14,000 a month. Um, so let's assume that you're paying $14,000 a month, unless you can qualify for MassHealth. MassHealth is the Massachusetts name for the Medicaid program. And, and Mary can qualify for MassHealth uh, as soon as she can show that she has less than $2,000 in countable assets. So if she were single at this point and had all of these assets, she'd have a problem. She'd have a lot of money she had to spend down um, until all she had left was the house. Once she owned the house, the house is not a countable asset. So you can qualify for Mass Health and own the house, but Mass Health will then put a lien on it in order to make sure that when you die, Mass Health will get repaid. So that's kind of how Mass Health works. But that's not the situation here, right? They're married, Frank's still alive, and he's healthy, which means that Mary, the day before she applies for Mass Health, or the day, Mary can become eligible for MassHealth immediately by simply transferring all of, first of all, by transferring all of her assets to Frank because she can't have more than $2,000, all right? So she's gonna transfer everything to Frank. And remember, there is no look back period regarding transfers between spouses. So she didn't have to do this five years ago. She can do it the day before she's gonna go apply for MassHealth. Now, once she moves everything to Frank, there are some limits on Frank's assets, <clears throat> but there is no limit to his income, and that's the trick. So Frank, at that point, can own the home no matter what the equity, no matter what the equity. Uh, once again, I do a lot of work in Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket. We, we have shifted homes worth two, three million dollars. House is completely safe, as long as it's with the well spouse. Um, her other assets, <clears throat> her other assets, though, cannot cannot be greater than $126,420. Don't ask me where these numbers come from. They come from the sky, right? So, so you know, they fall from the sky and every year they change. That's this year's number. But Frank can have unlimited income. So what Frank could do with all of his money, once again, Mary would have transferred it all to Frank. 
no look back period. <clears throat> Frank can then turn around, keep up to $126,420, and use the rest to buy one or more annuities. And as long as those annuities don't, can't be, can't be uh, cashed in for a lump sum, they no longer count as an asset, only as an income stream. So as long as the annuities can't be cashed in and they call for equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than Frank's actuarial life expectancy, and if he is 80, his life expectancy is around a little over 10 years, um, then the purchase of that annuity in any amount is a legitimate conversion from a countable asset to a non-countable income stream. So the day after Frank buys the annuity or annuities, Mary can qualify for Mass Health. So once again, going to those assets, what Frank would do is he'd keep the house, he'd take his IRA and annuitize it or annuitize some portion of it. And if he does that, by the way, that does not trigger an income tax, right? The annuitizing of the annuity does not trigger the income tax. It, it, it's going to speed up his income tax because the payments now that he's getting are going to be over this 10-year this period not over the kind of infinite period that Social Security normally allows, right? And when he gets the payments, he's going to have to pay the tax. But there's no immediate hit. So it really, it, it's, it's a minimal tax consequence. Um, their joint savings, well, that's going to be part of the annuity or part of the money that he keeps, he can choose, right? Um, Mary's savings, or, the, or Frank's, Frank's annuity, with Mary as a beneficiary, he's going to have to cash that out and get the money and turn it into this kind of special annuity. Because that annuity, I guarantee you, he can cash out, right? Typical annuities you can cash out, which means, as far as Mass Health is concerned, it's still cash. And Mary's savings are going to have to get transferred to him. And if Mary had a, 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 a 401k or an IRA, she'd have to pay the tax on her money before she transferred it to Frank. So there are some, there are some consequences to doing this kind of transferring. So Frank would want to weigh all this out. But the benefit is that just this gigantic monthly savings because once Mary is in, is in the nursing home on Mass Health, she has to keep paying her Social Security check of 1000 a month to the nursing home, but everything else is paid by Mass Health. Okay? Uh, possible issues. As I mentioned to you, if Mary had tax deferred, she'd have to pay the tax. Um, regarding Frank's annuity or annuities, when he buys those annuities, those have to be for a term, as I said, that is shorter than Frank's actuarial life expectancy. But if Frank dies before he's gotten all the payments and Mary has been on MassHealth, MassHealth will have a lien on those remaining payments. And that's why when Frank buys the annuity, while he would have the ability to buy it for up to 10 years, he may want to buy it for a shorter period of time so that he can get the payments back. Because if he's got the payments back, then as long as he's, th th and Mary dies, the money's safe, okay? And I, I should mention, a lot of times people will do this math and they go, wait, wait a minute, I thought Frank couldn't have more than $126,420. These are going to be these big annuity payments. Isn't he going to have more than that? Well, as long as he has less than that magic number on the day that Mary qualifies for Mass Health, the next day he can hit the lottery. Makes no difference what his assets are once Mary has qualified. So finally, for, for Frank and Mary then, basically, they can keep their assets you know, while they're both alive because if one of them needs nursing home care, they can just do all this restructuring then, right? There's no rush. The only thing they gotta worry about is what happens if Frank dies, right? Because if Frank dies and, and all of the assets then go to Mary and then Mary needs nursing home care, well then they've got a problem. The way to avoid that is pretty straightforward. Um, what, you do, what they would both do, and in this case, they would have to have wills. This is the one place, the one kind of plan where if they're trying to do this kind of protection, they have to have wills, and there has to be a probate when the first spouse dies. Because if Frank's will says that any of the assets that he owns when he dies, instead of going to Mary, go and trust for Mary's benefit. And if a third party is named as a trustee, Mary can't be the trustee in this case because she can't be in control of this money. But if one of the kids could, as long as that's what Frank's will says, and as long as the assets that they want to protect get into Frank's name before he dies. So if he has that stroke and he's still kind of hanging on, you know, I always tell the people, once you've done this plan, if one of you gets sick, first call the doctor, then call me. 
and we'll figure out whether we want to rearrange some things, right? So as long, whatever assets Frank owns when he dies will be permanently protected, non-countable, and non-leanable in the event that Mary then needs to qualify for mass health. So if they are concerned about those issues, and this issue gets to be of more concern as you, as you get older. The, the, it, uh, uh, that said, by the way, as I always say when I do these presentations, you get to be our age, fame and fortune has passed us by. You know, we're just too old. The goal of life at this point is to get a good night's sleep, right? So when do you do this? It's when you lose in sleep, you know, because you can do it any time before, as long as you do it before one of you dies, right? Um, but when you do it is when you just decide, now I'd rather know that if there was an emergency, that at the last minute we could restructure things, put everything in the name, you know, if somebody has a stroke, we're just gonna move everything into the, that person's name, and then it'll be safe. That's when you wanna do this. Um, the, all of that said, I just wanna mention this case, which is just came out about two months ago. And this is an interesting case regarding the law of unintended consequences. So as I mentioned a little earlier, um, if you had a will, if Frank had a will and left all of his assets to the kids or to the bimbo in Florida or to whoever, and he died owning all of these assets, Mary, as the surviving spouse, would have the right to waive that will and get instead her, what's called the statutory share. The old term used to be called dower, dower and courtesy, right? It's the statutory share. But until very recently, that statutory share was so ill-defined that very few people ever used it, used the statutory share. And then came this case. The case is called Siani? Yeah, Siani versus McGrath. And I attached a copy of this case to the handouts that I did today. Because it's just interesting sometimes to just read one of these because you get to see a genuine family feud, right? So, because this was a case where, the, uh, so Frank had had a, um, a will, and then he, he um, got divorced. He remarried, but kept the same terms in the will, and the will said everything goes to his kids, right? Which is not unusual in the case of, of uh, blended marriages, right? So, and then he died. And he owned some other cash, but then he also owned several pieces of real estate. He owned rental property, right? And his wife, the second wife, then, who was getting nothing under this will, exercised her right to waive the will and take her statutory share. Now, this, the statutory share, while it's, it's, it, it is not clearly written still, right, suggests <clears throat> that as to real estate, if the wife or the either spouse waives, it, declare, wants the statutory share, that statutory share is the income from one half, or excuse me, from one third of the value of the properties. Or if there are multiple properties, the income from one of those properties, if it equals a third of the value of all the properties, right? So the reason why that would seldom get used by the spouse was because typically the kids in that case, who were in control of these properties, would just make sure those properties didn't make any money, right? Would just, you know, make sure that they're just break even properties, especially if they didn't like the the, 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 the mother, you know, the, this, the, right? Um, but in, so in this case, though, the, the wife sued in probate court for a, uh, a partition of the real estate. If you, if you are the owner of an interest in real estate, whether it is a joint interest or, or an a, a interest that is a tenant in common, or as a life tenant of a piece of property, you have the right to force a sale of that property to force it by filing a petition to partition and then you get the judge to get someone called a commissioner to sell the property and then the judge divides up the money and he figures out the division according to what your interest was in the property. And so the court in Siani said that this, that this spousal share statute gives the surviving spouse the right to force a sale of the property and the division of this money in order to get her a share. Because she said, otherwise it's unfair because the kids can always, the kids can always not treat her fairly. Um, and so that's what happened. Now, how does that relate to this case? Well, it relates because if, if, if a spouse dies and the other spouse is on mass health, living, um, 
and that spouse doesn't claim his or her statutory share, right, then MassHealth can say that was a gift. The failure to accept assets that you could have gotten, as far as MassHealth is concerned, is a gift. And MassHealth can step in and claim that statutory share on your behalf. So in the Frank and Mary case, I think where this will go, this has not happened yet. There are no new regulations. This is in the great scheme of things. It takes a long time for people to adjust to something like this, right? But in this case, it may very well be that where Mass Health will go on this is they'll change their regs and, and start asserting on behalf of people who are in a nursing home that statutory share. So in this case, say Mary's in the nursing home, Frank shifted all the assets to him. Frank does this will in which he says all the assets are being held in trust for the benefit of Mary, but the trustee doesn't, isn't required to give Mary anything, right, during her lifetime. In that situation, Mass Health may say, we're going to step into Mary's shoes, assert the statutory share that Mary had, and get a piece of this money. And in the case of the real estate, the piece would be what the life estate on one third of the real estate is worth. So the real estate was worth $300,000. So a third of the real estate would be $100,000. The question would be, what is the life estate on that third worth? At Mary's age, at age 80, that would probably be about $15,000. So still, everything that I told you regarding restructuring things and then putting things in trust so that you can protect your spouse works, you just need to know that it may happen within the next few years that a little piece of that money that's being held in trust is going to have to go to mass health. So, with that in mind, uh, as I had mentioned, the goal of life is to sleep well at night. Uh, if you have loved this presentation and tell your friends, or I talk too fast and you want to see it again, Frank and Mary have their own YouTube channel, Elder Law Frank and Mary, and you can see it there. Or also, Hopkinton Cable is very kind to come and do these presentations because so many of the people that need to hear this can't get here because they're at home taking care of their spouse. So if you, you can also watch it on, on, I think it's on demand on, 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 Hopkinton, on Hopkinton Cable. The, Mr. Cable is, is saying yes, it is on demand so anybody can get this presentation. Uh, and the goal of life is to sleep well at night. So whatever of this, if it isn't bothering you, don't worry about it. Or you can always deal with it later. But if it is bothering you, you ought to do something. Thank you very much. Any questions? Covered a lot of material. Yes, sir. Uh, the last situation you described yep. with yep. creating a, a trust and transferring the assets. Yep. If Mary needs to go to nursing care yep. to qualify, yep. all the assets are shifted to Frank. Yep. And there's no look back period. It is just documenting it prior to a date so Mary can qualify. Does the house is the only uh, spousal share, should Frank die, that the state could challenge? So if he sold the house and just made it a annuity or some other asset as part of the trust, there would be no recourse for the state to for the lease. So the question is, regarding the last case that I talked about, what if Frank sold the house before he died and took the cat and just had cash, and therefore um, um, there was there, this 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 whole this particular issue of being able to sell the house doesn't doesn't affect you? That would avoid this real estate problem. There is a second aspect to the spousal share statute that I didn't go through, which says that regarding one third of the non real estate, Mass Health may be able to claim the income stream from that one third. This case really didn't figure that out, so I didn't figure that I would burden you with it. So but but, my, but my, my guess is that Mass Health is gonna deal, or that at some point there's gonna be a case that's gonna deal with that also. But, it, but in general, you got it exactly right. You got it exactly right. If at the last minute, Mary goes to the nursing home and shifts everything to Frank, and Frank then does the things that we've talked about here, Mary can qualify for Mass Health, and, if, and Frank can die, as long as he's got all of his assets back, because he's gotten all the payments back from that annuity that he bought, when he dies, if everything goes into trust, with this one caveat, the Siani caveat in mind, all the assets are safe. The money can be used to supplement Mary's care while she's in the nursing home. I always tell the people it's like buying the better wheelchair, buying the better 
trying to make her life as good as it can be as long as she's alive, right? Because she's not happy about being there, but you can improve her life. And then at the end, there's no lien on the assets so they can get divided among the kids. Thank you for the question. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, you said, mentioned the terms personal representative, executor, trustee. Are those all pretty much changed? Personal representative is what the executor used to be. That is the person who takes charge of the will and therefore takes charge of the probate assets and divides them up. The trustee is, is the person who takes charge of any assets that ended up going into trust. So if, for example, Frank died and left all the assets, they are all probate assets. For one year, those assets are subject to the claims of creditors, and the personal representative is in charge of them. At the end of that year, the personal representative goes to the will and reads it and says, now where do I put the money? And in this case, if Mary was still alive, the money would go into trust for the benefit of Mary, and the trustee would be in charge of that money. That could be the same person who was the personal representative, but doesn't have to be. Okay? Any other questions? Correct. And the probate at that point just went away. That's right. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. If Mary is going into a nursing home and has Alzheimer's, is yep. she able to transfer her assets? If Mary is going into the nursing home and has Alzheimer's, is she able to transfer her assets? No, unless she has a what? Unless she has a power of attorney. In which case, Frank, as her attorney, can do all this shifting as long as the power of attorney says that Frank can shift it to himself. Okay. That's why I mentioned that stuff, okay? Yes, sir. Yeah, Last question. Oh, you're going to do this five years before the event. So the question is, what about the advertising that says you have to do it five years before the event? The answer is, surprise, you don't. It's all made up. It's all made up. That is, the every week I talk to somebody who comes in positive that they've got to set up an irrevocable trust, transfer all the assets out and lose control of them. Otherwise, they're going to, they're, 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 they're do unless you're single. If you're single, that's what you have to do. If you're single and you want to protect things, you have to transfer things out, wait five years, either to your kids or to a trust or whatever. If you're married, you don't. So this whole thing is just, it's just to scare you. It really bothers me sometimes. Sharp practice. Th sharp practice, a wonderful old legal term. So thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it. I hope this, you found this helpful. And uh, I'll be doing a second presentation in a little while. I can't remember what date called. Um, um, Elder Law for Singles. So thank you very much. Um.